You are listening to The Effective Statistician, episode number 24, part 2 of Leadership Learnings with Walt Offen. Welcome to The Effective Statistician with Alexander Schacht and Benjamin Pieske, the weekly podcast for statisticians in the health sector designed to improve your leadership skills, widen your business acumen and enhance your efficiency. In today's episode, we'll chat again about leadership learnings. And these are leadership learnings with Walt Offen and it's part two of a uh, mini-series together with him. So if you haven't listened to part one, go back to see last week's episode, episode number 23, and first listen to that. This podcast is created in association with PSI, a global member organization dedicated to leading and promoting best practice and industry initiatives. Join PSI today to develop further your statistical capabilities with access to special interest groups, the video-on-demand content library, free registration to all PSI webinars, and these are really good, and much, much more. Visit the PSI website today at psiweb.org and learn more about PSI activities. And there you can also become a PSI member today. Welcome to the second episode with Walt about um, 20 attributes of highly successful leaders. And we have gone through the first 10 last week. And if you haven't listened to that episode, I would encourage you to, to first listen to the other episode. And now we get into the second 10 of the 20 attributes of highly successful leaders. Hi, Walt again. Hi, hi, Alexander. Yep, let's go with uh, number 11. Okay. Uh, I, I actually consider number 11 probably to be the most important development objective for everyone, uh, statisticians and, uh, and others. But uh, number 11 is having courage to speak up in all settings. Um, a couple of comments I will make here. Uh, one, I... I I, first of all, I will say and admit I consider myself introverted. And the reason I consider myself introverted is after a long day of work, I recharge by being home with my family or even being home alone. Uh, and uh, as opposed to somebody who's very extroverted who would feel like bored as soon as they got home, it'd be like, I got to go out to a bar or I got to go out to meet with a whole bunch of friends or, or whatever. And, um, what I have learned to do over the years, and this is how I put it, is to learn how to turn on an extrovert switch. And I think, I think many can, can do this at least to some extent. So for people who are uncomfortable in social settings where they don't know anyone, they don't know what to say to people and they're shy, they're uh, afraid to approach somebody and just start a conversation, um, I think I think we all have an ability to uh, to develop that skill to be able to to do that to have that courage, and uh, so I'm starting with courage in the social setting um, because when people get comfortable in that kind of a setting, I think that can then translate to being having more courage to speak up in a formal team meeting or whether it's well one-on-one -on -one is of course different but where you're in a, a team of 10 or 20 people and um and so there are a lot of ways to do this i think uh there are many who get involved in in their churches uh or in their kids uh sports or school and lots of informal settings where one can just be friendly to others and talk to them, could be on an airplane to the person next to you. And the more that, that people do that, the more comfortable they get in having the courage to speak out. So um, you, I know for me, early in my career, I would be in meetings and would even freeze, I think, if, if I was asked, can you comment on this? You're the statistician in the room. Uh, to where now I, I love, I actually love that opportunity. I want to be put on the spot. I feel like that'll actually help me get even stronger at being able to make important points in, in these kinds of settings. Um, so what are kind of, 
what are kind of the attitude um, or where, not the attitude, where are the situations where you think people have most problems to speak up? I think in, in uh, the larger the group, the more difficult. So that's a good question. So one-on-one, -on -one, of course, I mean, somebody that's really introverted and shy will even have trouble in a one-on-one. -on -one. And, and like going into an interview, they have nothing to say or they have just short answers. So it can, it can be uh, that extreme. But I would say the larger the group setting, the more difficult. So if you think in terms of a small team, maybe it's a statistician, programmer, and data scientist, And by the way, the starting small is how one develops this uh, uh, capability. You're able to to speak freely and you trust uh, the the other individuals. Uh, as you get into bigger and bigger settings, so now you've got maybe a, a medical vice president and, and some other folks, people are less have less courage in general than in the smaller settings. And then the ultimate is a room of 2,000 people or whatever, 500 people. Being able to go to the microphone, say who you are, where you're from, and, and ask a question or, or make a comment or a suggestion. And for me personally, I mean, that latter part, I feel like I've only developed in the last third of my career. Um, I, I was one who would almost never get up in that kind of a setting. So think in terms of a big ASA meeting or statistical conference or something like that. Uh, some are very good at it. Others are not. But the way to get better And to have that courage is to, is to just keep working on it in the smaller settings. And the reason it's critical, um, many examples where a team meets, there is a statistician there, let's say they're designing a clinical trial, and the statistician doesn't have the courage to speak up. So a physician might make a suggestion on a design that really the statistician knows is not a good suggestion. Uh, and, and, but because they don't have the courage to speak up, the team goes in a, in a wrong direction and it can lead to problems down the road and drug may not get approved. Uh, we might be preparing for an advisor or not necessarily advisor committee, but that's a, one, another example, but, uh, maybe the team is going to go to the FDA or a regulatory EMA regulatory authority and the statistician, if they don't have the courage to, to speak up and make sure the team understands the perspective from that science, from the statistical science, um, that that leads to potential failure. So it's not just, you know, being able to be seen and, and, and so on. It's, it's critical. The statistical input is often only seen by the statistician. So, um, and that's why I consider this to be so critical, that everybody really should feel that they can always improve their courage uh, to speak up. And speaking up can be asking questions, so it doesn't always say, I'm going to disagree with what this other individual said. It actually might be, I agree with that, and I'll tell you why. From my perspective, that helps the team understand that this is actually a good idea. The physician suggested it, the statistician explained why. Um, scientifically, it's valid, and it'll answer the objectives of the study, things like that. So it really, it really is critical for a successful statistician, uh, consulting statistician, to to develop that courage. And it does take development for most people. Uh, I think most people have some shyness. I, I think it's especially also true if there's some levels up uh, managers in the room. So, um, and I'm, that's also right for me. So, so it's kind of um, I'm getting better at it over time. But in the beginning, I would kind of, you know, if there would be someone with a, you know, major title, a president, a vice president or whatsoever, yeah. I would be completely kind of blocked out of, on that. And I think knowing that these are also just human beings, you know, they have a family, they, right, right, right. <laughs> you know, live a life. Yeah, and I think it's really helpful to have that in mind. But it also gets back to another point that we had in the in the last episode is about managing your emotions. Mm -hmm. There, it was more about the the uh, yeah being frustrated or being angry, and here it's about you know managing anxiety, managing fear. Yeah, to mm -hmm. not let that hold you back. Um, because and and 
you know, being able to recognize when you have these feelings, you know, what does it make with you? You know, your blood pressure goes up and you, you know, you, you feel maybe you get a red face or something like this. And, and I think acknowledging it, saying kind of, okay, that's what's happening now and trying to answer a difficult question like, what do I really want here now? And, and that helps actually to get the blood into the brain yeah. instead of kind of into your limbs. <laughs> and that helps to get your cognitive things going and that helps to overcome your fear. Yeah. So um, I always think that I really liked this technique that I learned in the training is, is about, you know, managing your emotions is asking a difficult question to your brain of what do you actually want and that helps you get back right, on track. Right, right. I think that's a good point. And and let me add to the point, this is as good a place as any, that everyone should feel uh, that they can always improve and they can push themselves to improve on any anything that we've talked about. And when it comes to courage in particular, I, I always encourage folks to, to start small. So those who have not given very many public presentations, start with a small team of statisticians give a, give a, or volunteer to give a seminar at your company or in a small team. The more you do it, the better you get. And, and I read a book many years ago. Um, I'm pretty sure the author is Malcolm Gladwell. The book is called Outliers. And one of the things that I remember very well from that book is that people, and he uses 10,000 hours as, as an example, people who are expert at something have have worked on it and and practiced it for over ten thousand hours, and if you do the math, that's like five years of uh, every day, eight hours a day. Um, the author uses examples of the Beatles, the the rock band, the Beatles, nineteen sixty three. This is uh, uh, you or your parents may know this that in Germany they played eight hours every day, every week for over a year. Um, before they came to the United States and became the phenomenon that, that they are. Uh, and, and so the Beatles did it. Um, uh, Bill Gates, I think, was another example in the book that he was programming like crazy and just really understood how computers work and so on. And so when he founded Microsoft, he was so strong and knowledgeable. Um, so I think of that in courage, too. I mean, I can say... Early in my career, when I spoke up at a meeting, I knew I was nervous. My voice showed the nervousness. <clears throat> but over time, you do that more and more, you begin to develop greater confidence. And even how you speak, your voice uh, begins to get better. And you, get, and you begin to have greater influence. So now people are actually really listening carefully to you. So I, I would say to people, if you're uh, nervous, you, you speak. <coughs> Excuse me. After after the meeting, you reflect and you say, "Oh man, I'm embarrassed that I did not do a great job." Keep working at it. Keep trying. Don't give up because you'll get better. Yeah, and in terms of this, um, having the courage to speak up in all settings, irrespective of kind of who you talk to, I think leads very good into the. Okay. Next point, which is actually kind of the reverse of, of it, more or less. Okay. So the next point, listen carefully to others <clears throat> and ignore rank in the company. In a way, these are two, two separate things. One thing that's critical in developing leadership skills is to be able to listen to others, listen to their perspective. And I've taken a lot of training on listening skills, developing them. <coughs> and what is often taught is it really helps when the listener is able to say back to the other individual what they just heard. So in their own words, say, what I'm hearing you say is you're concerned about this or that. And, and that's really an excellent way to understand each other. So listening is not just passively listening, but it's giving feedback and saying, here's what I'm hearing you say, and, and so on. So I think listening is a very critical um, leadership attribute. The ignoring rank, well, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Actually, I think 
I, actually, I think this is even more important nowadays, where we lots of the meetings, lots of the discussions are at least partially virtual, and people um, start to multitask, say to other things instead of kind of listening to what the others yeah. are, are saying. Um, for me, actually, <laughs> again, kind of turning the video camera on helps to kind of stay focused in these settings and not kind of drift away and be kind of distracted from yep. from other mm -hmm. things that are going on on your computer so so um looking the others into the face and and really listening to them and knowing that they also see your face helps a lot i completely uh, agree I, I and <clears throat> actually you bring up a point where i might call that engagement It's not just, I tell you, it's not just when you're on the phone in a meeting. It's even in a meeting, so many people will open their computer and send an email or, you know, they're not engaged in the discussion. Um, and and I, I am one who I agree with people that say, number one, don't hold meetings and don't stretch them out to waste people's time. So I think meetings are very important to be well organized have the discussion that's needed, uh, make the decisions, and then end early. If you're done early, end early. If you if people follow that, then then everyone at that meeting should close their laptops, be completely engaged. And so listening but engaging is, is, is really the piece of it. So they really are part of the conversation. So they're listening, they're saying what they think uh, should be considered and so on. So that is very critical. And I, and I think that's a problem. More and more, we uh, mentioned in the first episode that I encourage uh, statisticians to go to meetings in person whenever they can. Uh, just as you said, when you call in, you start getting distracted and you're not really engaged. Um, and, and so that's critical in, in uh, meetings that we participate in. Um, the, the, the second part is really almost another topic, ignoring rank within the company. I believe successful companies are ones where uh, – people don't have to go through their management chain. And I forget where I just recently saw, I read this recently. Um, if I'm a statistician, I'm working with a physician, I have my management and that person, you know, eventually goes up to the vice president of statistics and then the physician has their management. I mean, we should be able to talk to each other directly and we need to be able to talk to each other directly. And so, Ignoring the rank, the successful organizations are ones where everyone has the freedom to speak with anyone. And um, uh, all I can say is that I have seen organizations where that is not the case and it's an awful place to work. It's, it's not a place where there will be great success. You just need to be able to, to, uh, to talk with anyone ignoring rank. And at meetings, Same kind of idea. You mentioned it. If you have a VP in the room, you might feel a little bit inhibited. Um, but 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 for a successful outcome, uh, everyone should feel they are equally free to speak uh, their opinion, give their advice, ask the questions. And ultimately, it could be that the VP is the decision maker. That's fine. But everybody should feel and needs to feel that they can speak up and ignore rank. Uh, you can disagree with the senior VP. Uh, you do it diplomatically or, or uh, you know, in a, in a nice way, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's appreciated by that senior leader. Yeah, I can, I can just remember a situation where I have been in, um, where I was, um, it was actually after um, a business development project, and we talked about in a very, very senior team about the outcome of that development and what are the recommendations to move forward and I was in the actual team that did this evaluation and then the, my VP actually said something about it and said um, uh, we should do this and that and I said that doesn't actually help here And I was, I was so afraid in the moment. I was saying, should I hold back? Should I speak up? 
I was, you know, and, and, and I was actually on the phone. I was the only one that was calling <laughs> in. I was yeah. double terrified. Um, and I was, but then I actually spoke up and said, um, I, I think that's a nice suggestion, but it doesn't really kind of help here for these and these reasons. And the good thing is I got never kind of bad feedback from the VP about it. So, so I, I said really encouraged me to, to speak up in these kind of settings. Um, because I was really sure about my case. Um, otherwise I probably, and, and there was a really very few minutes left mm -hmm. in the hour to, to speak about it. Otherwise I would probably have just asked a question to give the VP yeah. a kind of point to think about it again. But, um, That was, um, yeah, that was a pretty, very frightening uh, situation for me. But um, afterwards, yeah. I felt much Yeah, that's, much that's better. good. And, you know, every example like that, <clears throat> it, at least to some extent, depends on the other person. Uh, you know, there are cultures in, in the world, in businesses or organizations where that leader is insecure and might feel like, hey, before we actually go to this meeting, I want everyone to be aligned. Uh, personally, I, I, I really welcome disagreement. And uh, it, uh, people just uh, need to learn how to do it in a way that's not threatening or you know, critical of the personal or the individual, things like that. Um, so I, I don't want to scare anyone away from it, but I think the way you described it is, is really excellent. You should bring it up. If later you do get some negative feedback, I would take that feedback and how you delivered it, not in, in actually speaking up. I think speaking up is important. If, and I will say this too, if the supervisor, the VP feels like you should have kept your mouth shut because you made me look bad, that person will eventually leave the company. I mean, in any good company, good functioning company, that's not who we need as leaders. They need to be open-minded. They need to be able to take some criticism of their ideas or challenges to their ideas. That's my view anyway. And I've seen leaders that beha behave poorly. They end up leaving the company finally and, uh, and things get better again. Yeah. Yeah. So let's move on to the next point, which is, which is also about, um, leadership employee kind of relationships yeah so this is 13 this is uh, in so <clears throat> what i'll read what i have instituting any new rule or policy must affect the leader equally so <clears throat> um I, i have a great i think it, maybe i'll start with that i have what i consider to be a great example um and it's about uh, uh, a united states general who became president dwight D. Eisenhower. And <clears throat> I never read a book. I know there are lots of books about him, but I did read an article about a story where he and his troops uh, conquered a, an island or a territory or whatever. And <clears throat> what I didn't realize until I read this is when that happens, there are often goodies, if you will, like wine. There are often things that when they capture soldiers they have things like wine food and whatnot and if a general feels like well this is going to be for my <clears throat> senior leadership that's not going to be very inspiring for the troops and so what eisenhower always did is that everybody <clears throat> everybody shares in the bounty if you will so back to our kind of a world If there are policies, uh, I don't know if I have a great example, but if if the senior leaders say, um, I don't know what it would be, but, uh, well, maybe this is kind of an example. No, no smoking. I don't want any smoking on the site. But the VP says, well, it doesn't apply to me. I'm going to smoke in my office. Um, that is really bad. So any kind of policy that's out there needs to apply equally to everyone all the way up to the CEO. Does that make sense? I don't know if you have yeah. examples that would help I, I'm, illustrate I'm, this. But. I'm just thinking of an example. And also you need to make the policies, you know, in a way that they are fair and not um, kind of tweak it in your favor. So imagine kind of the policy is everybody needs to fly economy. 
There yeah. you go. And, and 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 then you you go go to a meeting and you realize that oh there's the the boarding card for your VP on on the desk and it says business class. Yeah. How would you feel about that? Right. Yeah. Right. So this, this VP made the policy all fly economy, but he feels entitled himself to fly business. That would feel very, very bad to the people. That's right. That's right. So I think that's that's one of the, the cases. Um, and I think it's about this um, humility. You know, I think if you feel entitled, that's, then you're not humble anymore. So, so um, right. and we talked about that in, in the last episode. That's really, really crucial yeah. as, as a leader. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I have another recent example that is not in our industry, but um, <clears throat> I'm very interested in the company Tesla makes electric, uh, electric cars. And recently the CEO, Elon Musk, uh, is sleeping in, uh, on the floor or on a couch. And so he is there to help. I mean, one could question, is he micromanaging? I don't know. But what he's clearly doing is saying he's not just instructing his people, you guys have to work long hours. I want you to work overtime. And I'm going to work eight to four or eight to five and, and go home and have a nice dinner with my family. So the, so the analogy, just to give another example, Alexander, to our field is when, when the crunch is there for let's say, creating a new drug application. The senior leader, if they kind of say to all the people on the team, you guys, I need you to work weekends, I need you to work nights, uh, we got to get this done <clears throat> as fast as we can. And yet that leader says, oh, by the way, I'm taking two-week vacation to go down to the, you know, whatever, some nice beach or something. That that really doesn't work well. I mean, that leader has to really be all in with them. And this is another one where I feel like I can do better at this, but, um, but it is important um, uh, for, for the leader to be a part of the, to, to basically uh, share in the, pl uh, in the pain. So whatever pain is necessary to accomplish the goal, they need to have some, something in that game. Yeah. I think that is where the relationship comes in and, that also makes sure that you primarily work through the relationship power and uh, not so much on the role power. Um, yeah. Okay, let's move on to um, point number 14. Okay, so <clears throat> 14, when I looked at this uh, last night, uh, what it said was do what is needed, not waiting to be told what to do. It really is the same as something we talked about in the first uh, session. And so I, I changed it. Um, and so let me tell you what I changed it to, and then I'm going to give you an example, a personal example. And what I changed it to is to say, uh, grab, it's not, it's not worded as well as it could be, but grab opportunities when they come your way, even if you do not feel that you're ready. <clears throat> Now, I'm going to give you an example of when I was, I believe, about four years into my career. So I was at Lilly for four years, around 1984, and our senior or actually chief medical officer had a meeting, I didn't even know, but had a meeting at Lilly uh, with a lot of external experts in the room. <clears throat> and in the middle of the meeting, he called my boss and said, gee, could you have Walt come in here? and talk about, and I don't know what it was. All I know is I panicked. It's like, oh my God, I, I first, I didn't know this was going on. Second, I don't have anything prepared. And, and he, and the senior VP, this medical director, I'm sorry, medical chief medical officer. So that's okay. That's okay. Just have him come in and we'll ask him some questions. In the end, <clears throat> my boss stood up for me and said, he, he can't do it. I mean, we, he had no, absolutely no prep time. And, when I think back to that time, I wish I had gone because <clears throat> I would have grown enormously in that one hour. I would have all of a sudden come out of that where now I can, if I can handle this, I can handle anything. And uh, so I regret being too afraid to just let myself be exposed, if you will. So I encourage people, sometimes, you know, you go through your career and you're doing a job, you do it well, you learn 
and you feel like, God, I wish I had some opportunities. Sometimes those opportunities come when you least expected them or you didn't ask for them. And uh, I just encourage people to go for it. Uh, just do the best you can. You People will, for the most part, people understand that you had no time to prepare. You're going to have many questions. In, in my example, I would have had many questions. I would have said, I'll get back to you. I don't, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Um, I, I just encourage people to go for it. Uh, use those kinds of opportunities because they're few and far between. <laughs> yeah. If you speak about that, there's a couple of quotes for example, from Richard Branson about it, you know, the Richard Branson from the Virgin right, Group right. Um, very often speaks about this kind of, you know, grab the opportunity and then figure out how to do it. Uh, I think it also has something to do with taking calculated risks. So, yeah. so maybe you, you haven't completely thought through it, but jump into the water and start yeah. swimming. Um, but because very often kind of, Something that is maybe not 100% of a fit is much better than nothing at all. You know, so, so, um, and I think it's also again comes kind of managing your fear. There's your fear of, you know, not getting things done completely right, right. completely kind of perfect. Right. Um, I think that is very often what, what holds us back. Um, and I always kind of have people on my team that want to do these kind of things. And um, sometimes it doesn't work out. Okay, acknowledge that right. and, and learn from it and, right. and, and move forward. And, and it's, But it's, that has also some things then in turn to kind of the culture was dealing with mistakes that we talked about yep. in the earlier episode. Okay, Walt, then let's go to number 15 now. Okay, thank you, Alexander. Uh, number 15 I have is see the issue from others' perspectives. This, I feel, is uh, uh, a very important aspect of leadership that um, – in a sense, one could uh, summarize this with one word, and that is listening. And listening means not only being quiet while somebody else is speaking, but really understanding where they're coming from. Uh, one, uh, one way to really show that you're listening is to say back to that individual what you heard, what you understand their position is, and so on. And... Um, And it's really important to be able to see uh, from others' perspectives. Uh, if, if one doesn't do that, it gets into basically an argument that, you, that one person will just totally repeat what they think or what their position is on whatever the issue is, and, uh, and, and really you never get anywhere. So, so I say that both in one-on-one -on -one discussions or in a team meeting. Uh, where you may have an opinion and somebody else is disagreeing with you, it really helps to be able to say back to them what you're hearing them say. Um, and although it's not really part of this, I, I think I want to also just say uh, something that I do fairly often in team settings is when I hear somebody else in the room say something that I can build on, I think that really helps as well. So I don't just come out with a completely different comment or suggestion or idea that isn't tied to something that somebody else has already said. And if you tie it to something somebody else has said, it, it helps people understand your point. Um, so the, the last thing I want to say about this one, I'm going to share an example with the audience. Uh, many years ago, at least I would say 15, probably about 15 years ago, I was with a team uh, from my company, from Lilly. Uh, we were at FDA, and we were having a discussion about one of the projects. Uh, and in fact, it was after phase three had concluded. So we had phase two data, phase three data. And without getting into any specifics, there was some disagreement from the FDA people, including the statistician and, uh, and Lilly folks that were trying to Uh, describe uh, an aspect of the data. And I remember very clearly I was sitting at the table 
uh, and right behind me were a couple of staff assistants from FDA who I knew. One I knew very well. And so she leaned over to me during the meeting and showed me uh, what she had, which helped me understand that actually the FDA position was correct. And so I did my best to kind of smooth that over. I spoke up. And um, what I believe things like that do is the credibility, integrity, everything just rocketed sky high. So I feel like for me, that was in a sense a defining moment that FDA folks, I think they could, they, I think they felt they could trust me if I said something, they knew there was uh, honesty there a lot of times. And so broadening this to any kind of conversation one might have, if people are always just, I don't know, not being sincere and honest in what they say, people see through that and and pretty soon their that person's ability to influence really goes down. So um, so my point there, I guess, is to keep one's integrity uh, above all else, uh, and that and that really will help the individual. I th I think it's also kind of um, looking into the things from different perspectives is also to help understand why per you know, there might be contradicting truths, so to say, because, mm -hmm. you know, I very often, you know, there's lots of different kind of experiences and viewpoints on things. So just a couple of uh, points. So, so if, um, if you work with a physician that comes, you know, fresh out of uh, the clinic and was head of the department there and, you know, What he was said was done. It was, you know, yeah, you know, emergency kind of setting. And then this kind of sets his his truth, his you know, truth in terms of how to work together. Right. And so, so having this in mind when working with uh, such people that you know are not accustomed to. Um, you know, very cross-functional teamwork where there's lots of different, you know, expertise from different ends that helps to work with, together with them. The other thing is also, you know, something that may make complete sense in, let's say, uh, from a stat side in um, HDA setting may be, you know, pretty bizarre in a regulatory setting and the other way around, yeah? So right. um, just if you think about how um, the Cochrane collaboration looks into things and, you know, doing meta-analysis, and then on the other hand, you have these uh, pre-specification of the RCTs and, you know, very, very kind of... Um, forward-looking plan stuff. And on the other hand, you have this um, analysis of literature data. You know, these kind of things come from very, very different perspectives. And understanding that helps a lot with kind of seeing that, you know, there might be alternative ways to look into things. And just because, right. you know, you may have just a very, very specific experience And that might not coincide with with other people people's experience. Yeah, yeah, I think that's well said, Alexander. I, in some sense, I think almost any topic has more than one valid viewpoint. I mean, and, and if if everyone kind of goes into a discussion or a negotiation with that in mind, it really helps move uh, move the needle and move move along and, and solve the problem or or reach consensus, whatever. Um, uh, if if anyone feels like their view is the only way, the only right answer, uh, that just is it's not going to work. So, mm. okay, very good. Let's move on Great. to point number sixteen then. Okay, so sixteen is understand, appreciate and celebrate diversity of thought, personality, skills, and beliefs. And I could have added more, uh, more adjectives or more things uh, on diversity. Basically, for, for a team, company, whatever, organization, let's say, for an organization to be successful, I think everybody has to go into that, really appreciating people for who they are. So one thing that I didn't put there, but I think we talked about it on one of my earlier 
points is extrovert versus introvert. Um, people uh, should not feel like one is better than the other. Um, uh, either extreme uh, can be bad. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that aspect of diversity. If somebody is so introverted and what I would call extremely shy that they really have difficulty even speaking anything, that's obviously an extreme that that person needs to work on and develop and get comfortable speaking in public and so on. And then the opposite is bad too. Somebody who's so extroverted that they just don't listen to anyone. They're just always talking. They can't, they can't stop and listen. They'll interrupt people. That's bad. Anything else though is, is uh, that should be appreciated. It's good to have some extroverts. It's good to have some introverts. So when we talk about beliefs, uh, background, you know, you mentioned Alexander on the last one, um, People, uh, people grow up in different settings, so they have different environmental factors and so on. They have different um, backgrounds that lead them to where they are and, and have shaped their personalities. So my point here is, um, and, and as uh, those who have listened to the earlier couple of podcasts know that I like sports analogies, I feel like in any sport, team sport, it's so important that the different positions have different skill sets. You need diversity. Uh, as an example, if every uh, uh, basketball team had excellent three-point shooters, but none of them can play defense, none of them can drive to the basket, that team's going to lose. Same thing in in uh, in an organization of any sort. If everybody is thinking along the same lines, the same dimension, if you will, uh, nobody disagrees with anybody. There's groupthink. Um, you don't get the best solution. So, um, so we really should embrace and value um, diversity in every aspect. Yeah, and I think diversity very often is just kind of, you know, in terms of demographics. But I think mm -hmm. much more important is kind of this diversity of thought and diversity of perspective and diversity of skills and beliefs um, that yeah. could be could be associated with demographics, but but not necessarily. Um, That's right. Yeah. And especially in our business, kind of when you think about, we have really global businesses, so um, yeah. therefore we also you know. It really helps to have a global perspective on things because uh, problems in one country might be completely different to problems in another country. I'm just thinking about all the different health systems we have around the world. It's um, right. knowing about these, acknowledging these um, will help so much in our industry. Yeah, I totally agree. And the other thing that that makes me think of is Within statistics, I think this is true across our industry, and maybe it's even true uh, for statisticians in any industry. There are so many uh, trained statisticians from all over the world. So, you know, at AVI, and I think this is true at Lily too, a very large proportion are from Asia. Some are mainland China, some are Taiwan. And, and one thing that I, I've enjoyed, and I think it also helps develop these um, good cohesive teams is to learn a little bit about where they're from and uh, and uh, what their childhood was, you know, what their upbringing was like and so on, where their parents live today, their siblings, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and, and where, where somebody grew up can make them very different. And, you know, if somebody's just focused on wherever, whatever country they're from and doesn't realize the different cultures in different countries or parts of the world, um, that's really difficult. People just need to open their minds and be accepting, which goes back to the other topic a little bit. But, um, but I think that's very important, and it's really and it's really a blessing. It's just great to have people from all different uh, parts of the world that are working in the same uh, physical space. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, and I see this strong connection to to the other one. So, so I think um, if you're blind for others' perspectives, and it's very very difficult to also celebrate diversity of thought. Right. The next one, point seventeen, is actually one that I really really like. Okay, so um, this one is always strive to get better and help those around you. Um, I'll start with just a little story that I, uh, 
for whatever reason, <laughs> you know, and, and I think maybe a lot of people feel this way. People get an advanced degree. Most of our statisticians have either masters or PhDs. And you feel like I've been well trained. I go into a new job and I don't, I, you, you feel like you don't need to get better. You're at the top of your life. You got a PhD. You're very knowledgeable in a lot of different statistical methods. And, and I was that way. I really think it took me a, a number of years in, early in my career before I understood um, that, that there are things I can work on, that I can get better at. Some of that soft skills. In fact, probably most of it is for many statisticians. And so having a healthy attitude throughout your entire career, I know I have grown in the, in the six years I've been at Abbey, having that healthy attitude really helps everyone. And and, and likewise, looking out for others, um, especially as one gets uh, well into their career, they've been doing that work for five years or more. Um, as new people come in to the team, helping them uh, grow, helping them see, uh, learn new things and, 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 and giving them opportunities to, uh, to, to be successful. All of that is important for a great and successful organization. Yeah, I think especially the helping others is amazingly important. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's, you know, first need to give to receive something. And that is, mm -hmm. um, will help so much to be a leader. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And in terms of the striving for better, I, I just remember my first weeks in the farm industry after I received my PhD. There were so many things that I have never thought about. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think the, the first yeah. time I saw a CRF collecting AE data and how to analyze it, I had no clue about it. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> How do you make sense of it? And just think about today where uh, when I started, genetics data wasn't there. But now, I mean, you could have humongous databases of uh, genetic information and how the heck you make sense of that. There's there's many things. The bottom line is there are many things to learn throughout one's career. And and, and actually, what I will say for me, the, the thing that I was most uh, resistant to are various training programs or lectures on more of the soft skills, you know, I, uh, and, and that's where I think everybody can always improve. They can always get better at everything that we've been talking about in these leadership uh, topics, um, as well as other things. If somebody doesn't speak English very well, they can work on that and improve it. Um, and, and being cognizant of that is step number one. Yeah. If you, if we want to, Go back to a sports analogy. You know, all these super athletes, they train and train and get coaching every day. Um, yeah. And they're, you know, they're there and they always have something to improve. So, so yeah, it's, it's really, it's really important yeah. to keep that. I once heard a sentence, the day you stop learning, you start dying, which maybe is a little bit too pathetic, but. <laughs> Yeah. Just easy to say it again. The, the, the day the day you stop learning, the day you stop learning, yeah. you start dying. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, but on the sports analogy, you know, a perfect example just to make this really clear to people is every sport has uh, every professional sport has draft day, and uh, the number one person picked is going to be the person who in college was an absolute superstar. Whatever position they played, they were like unbelievable. When they come to the, uh, uh, let's say the National Basketball Association and NBA, um, all of a sudden they're going to be on the bench for a while. They may play, but you can tell they don't really know what they're doing. And, um, and I've seen players that every year they get actually better and better. Um, and they're clearly working in the off season, things like that. So, um, yep. Yep. Yeah, I just, just wanted to add to that. Okay. Uh, a little bit okay. related to that is actually number 18, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, let, let me say what it is. So 18 is do not take, uh, quote, we've always done it that way, unquote, as an acceptable answer. That is, don't be satisfied with the status quo. The we, uh, I think it's a little different, at least how I intended it, in that 
if if um, if you're uh, let's say in a team and there's a discussion on how, wh- how do we accomplish this particular goal or or whatever it is, maybe it's regarding a clinical study. Too many times I've heard people, and it's usually the people that are have been at the company for twenty years or whatever, uh, will say, uh, "We've always done it this way. It's worked. We've been successful in the past. Why change it now?" Now I will also say. There, this has two extremes too, because for somebody to always want to constantly change things, I don't think that's good either. But I don't think it's acceptable to to just be comfortable with the status quo and and just continue doing things like you've always done it. Because technology, in particular, gets better and better. There can be more efficient ways of doing things. Um, so that's kind of kind of what I meant there. Is I, leadership is something that. Uh, the people who exhibit leadership skills see different, better ways to do things. And, uh, or at least they think there is a better way. And so they will talk to others and, and really uh, understand the problem well. And together that team can improve whatever, whatever it is. So that's, that's what I intended there. Yeah. And I think it's always also good to understand what are the assumptions behind why it was successful Are these assumptions still valid? Yeah. yeah so right. Is the environment the same? Is the technology the same? Uh, are the limitations the same? Um, that is, I think, a very, very important thing. If, if these things change, then what you have done before might not be even valid anymore. Mm-hmm. That's true. Okay, let's go to number 19. Okay, 19, be a solid role model. Um, I do consider this to be very important. This is not just uh, for managers. I don't know if we've talked much about the difference between management and leadership, yes, but yes. This, is for, this is for anyone. Uh, be a solid role model. Um, there's, there's a saying that says, treat others the way you would like to be treated or the way that you would like them to treat you. And um, it, really, it really fits, and it's a very important part of leadership. Um, Uh, I, I have an example, I guess, let me go to that right now. because I, uh, this, this to me, I've, I've actually watched this video. It's about maybe 10 minutes, eight minutes long, but about a year ago, um, there was, uh, an air force general who addressed his troops because there was some racism. I don't know exactly the extent of the racism. It may have been name calling. It may have been worse. But there was racism. And so what this general did is he got everyone in a room and you can go on YouTube and, and I actually have uh, how I find it. It's n- uh, no room for racism in this general's Air Force. If one were to put that into YouTube, I think you'll find it. Or you can go and, to the um, show notes and then you will find it there. Yeah, very good. Okay, it'll be there. And um If you listen to this guy, I mean, the passion in his voice is incredible to me. Uh, and I got to believe everyone in that room understood where he's coming from, understood that he was right, that he will not tolerate racism in his uh, unit. And um, and so that, uh, for me, is, is one, I know there are others too, where it's a perfect example of somebody who is an excellent role model. And I think... All of us, as part of leadership, can really strive to be a role model. It could be, uh, just to keep on the same theme, it could be that one of us sees, uh, whether it's uh, sexual harassment or, or racism or something like that, is to not just kind of walk away and say, uh, it's to be a leader and, and, and really help to make things better. Uh, so that's, so this, this applies broadly. This is... Uh, um, You know, I, I know, maybe another example I can give is, uh, and I've been in this setting, you can be in a meeting where you see two people that are really kind of getting mad at each other. They're, they're sort of fighting verbally in, in a meeting is, is to not just leave a room after the meeting and figure, well, hopefully they'll work it out, is to actually step up and, and maybe talk to them each individually, try to help them uh, see each other's perspectives, and that's leadership. That's being a role model. Yeah, and I think it's also b- about being consistent in that. So always doing it that way. Yeah. Um, I remember yeah. a quote from one of the leadership trainings I attended. 
uh, and it was a very senior person uh, uh, from the company and he said as a leader you can't have a bad day and yeah that's interesting yeah i remember that so vividly because i thought wow that's a really bold statement and i think see um it's you know to have control over your action to be consistent and control over your emotions and um you know don't just let it go and and um of, yeah. of course you know it doesn't say that you know every day will be a good day it's just that i right. think the it's about the attitude you know going into the day and going through the day reminding yourself to um stay present you know observe yourself and and you know yeah be this role model over the day yeah yeah and that's really good alexander and it, t- it ties in nicely to an earlier topic which is uh, nobody's perfect so when when a leader has a bad day being able to apologize being able to you know the next day or whatever say i'm sorry that i reacted that way or i said that i was wrong uh, and i apologize i'll do better you know so that 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 totally takes away that bad day. I mean, it, uh, in fact, that even in some ways can strengthen a, a person's leadership abilities because none of us are perfect. All of us are going to miss say something. Uh, we'll, we'll make mistakes one way or another. And just being able to say, I'm sorry, that's on me. Uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll work harder. Please uh, forgive me. Uh, I was just in a meeting the other day. I mean, uh, in fact, uh, two days ago, where a VP apologized to me and some other statisticians because we got invited to a particular session. It was an all-day meeting on a on a specific topic, very late, and a couple of folks were not even in the office, so they couldn't come. They were traveling. It was like literally a week ahead of time, and so he apologized, and. Um, Anybody that might have been angry with them or angry at the situation that we weren't invited sooner, just immediately, it's like, okay, I, uh, uh, he, he knows that it was an, an error, an oversight, and um, we're all really happy to be working with this guy. So, um, yeah, yep, anyway. Yep, that's, that's very good. It, maybe it has actually something to do with the last thing as, itself, uh, with point number 20. Yeah. Yeah. So 20 is develop self-confidence, be able to laugh at yourself. And um, yeah, it is related, but let me uh, say a couple of words about this. No, number one, self-confidence. Some people are, uh, I, I don't know if anyone's born with it, but uh, but some people definitely develop that earlier than others in life. I consider myself one who developed it more later in life. And um and, uh, and, but I think everyone's capable of developing it to at least a certain extent. And so what that means is that if somebody, I don't know, maybe criticizes you and says you did not do a very good job there, you can actually stay calm. You can, um, you can, uh, say, I, I, I appreciate your feedback, things like that, rather than becoming, um, uh, defensive and and just trying to argue why you were right or you know or whatever so self-confidence is is a lot about being able to take criticism um and and actually thanking the individual for giving you the their perspective uh if you're being criticized and things like that the laughing at yourself i want to say a few uh extra words on um one is uh, not taking yourself too seriously, I think, is important in any setting. I mean, honestly, if if any team has an individual who is super serious all the time and, let's say, frowns if somebody makes a lighthearted joke, people are laughing, you know, that's sad. I, I, I think everybody needs to be able – everyone should try to have fun in the workplace um, – but laughing at yourself is 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 really a strong part of self confidence. Being able to poke fun at yourself, uh, be self deprecating, um, and um, and and so the story I want to I want to tell here is uh, I 
am one who believes a sense of humor is a very important leadership skill. And um, because it has such a beneficial effect on everyone, it, it can you know, let them ease. I mean, you a team might be in a crunch like we have 24 hours to respond to this FDA request and everyone's nervous. And it's, oh, my God, I can't go home tonight because we got to get this done. Having a, 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 a little breaking the ice with, with a joke or whatever or, um, and even poking fun at oneself can break that and, and make everyone actually achieve that particular task at hand. And um, the story that, that I'll tell is, um, and, and Alexander, you may be, uh, you may remember this or may have been a part of it. I don't remember who, but when the leadership program at Lilly was developed, uh, many years ago now for statisticians, um, we had a, 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 a deck of cards. I think it was like 60, 70, maybe even more. Each card had a different leadership aspect. And one of them was sense of humor. And, and the way what we had at Lilly were groups of maybe eight tables of eight or 10 people. And we would go through and try to pick the 10 most important ones. And I was the only one that kind of felt like, I think the sense of humor is pretty important. <laughs> and, and uh, and it didn't make it didn't make the cut. So at least I got it on my I got it on my top twenty. Um, so yeah, so I, I, maybe that's all I need to say. But I I'm, but I think I think that's something that everybody can work to develop. And uh, you find fun in in work, and everything goes so so much better. I think it's um, actually a sign of self confidence if you can laugh at yourself. And also where it helps yeah. amazingly is to be more approachable. So I think yeah. especially for if you're also a, um, a supervisor, if you get more senior in the organization, um, if you can laugh at yourself, that will help a lot for people that are less experienced or um, uh, in the lower ranks of the organization to be able to speak up to you. Um, so right. I think you're more yeah. approach. Yeah. You're more approachable. Uh, it, people are comfortable in coming to you. I know we talked about that earlier yeah. as well on one of the 20 topics is that an effective leader is one who others do not fear to come to with their problems or with a problem. And uh, absolutely right. Um, well, we are now yeah. on endings at 20 <laughs> and we have an amazing yep. two hours of content. Um, I'm so happy uh, that you were on, the, on this call um, with me and shared so much really, really valuable uh, things. Um, I very, very much enjoyed the discussion with you. Do you have yeah. some... I, I did as well. Fine, I did as well. Thank you, Alex. Do you have some final thoughts, uh, kind of key takeaway? Yeah, um, yeah let, let me uh, end with a couple of things. One, one that I just uh, want to make uh, very clear to people, I, I, and I'll say it this way as to start, is... Um, even even me, I've, I, I do this too. People say, well, the leadership team has met and have decided X. And, and I actually feel like we should really call it the management team because leadership is for everyone. So I, I know I've said this probably more than once already, but um, everybody listening to this should not feel like, well, you know, I'm an individual contributor. I'm new to, the, to my job, my role, and so this isn't for me. Leadership is for everyone, and and some people can be really really effective managers, but they're not very inspiring, so they're not really very good leaders, and vice versa. Some people can be leaders and not be good managers. So, so um, the one thing that I probably have said before that I just want to reemphasize is that for somebody who does have supervisory uh, responsibilities. Their challenge in leadership can be more difficult than someone who does not because when a supervisor tells one of their uh, employees that they need to do something, uh, the person's going to do it because that's the boss asking you to do it. Leadership is about inspiring somebody to, to say, what do you think? I think we can achieve this. I think together we can improve this process. We can do this better. Uh, we can solve this problem. 
So leadership is inspiring, and um, and so it's for everyone. Um, and so the the second thing I just wanted to read this just literally it's probably now two weeks ago. Uh, I read an article about uh, Jeff Bezos, who is the founder and CEO of Amazon.com, who I'm sure everyone has heard <laughs> about. Um, and uh, and it, sh- it it said that what he said in this, uh, I guess it was kind of an interview that I read, is that he has uh, an inspirational message on his refrigerator. He says he reads it every day. Every day when he opens the refrigerator, he sees it. And um, it was only a little later that I learned that this is actually written Uh, authored by Ralph Waldo Emerson, a very famous uh, poet. And so let me read it. It's not that long, but I I think uh, it really hits me. I I haven't put it on my refrigerator yet, but I might. Um, And here it is. He says, To laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics, and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded." And I think that's great. Um, you know, a lot of people, there have been a lot of d- people have discussed, you know, what does success mean? Does it mean having a huge house and, you know, a million dollars and, and all this kind of stuff? And um, I, I think this definition is, is really excellent. And it's what we all strive to do. And, um, and I'll just leave it at that. Right. I absolutely have nothing to add here. Thanks so much. Okay. Okay, thank you as well. I really appreciate it. This podcast was created in association with PSI. Thanks for listening. Please visit theeffectivestatistician.com to find the show notes and learn more about our podcast to boost your career as a statistician in the health sector. If you enjoyed the show, please tell your colleagues about it. That is so important to me because only through that we can make sure that as many people as possible um, really benefit from this podcast so please tell your colleagues about it